lets me the most connected human on Earth. I am you, just a few years from now. My personal existence is a relationship between the unseen world and my participation with it. I now see information. I see it everywhere. I'm not actually that different than most people. Everyone is being tracked in every way possible. What I'm talking about is taking control of it for yourself. That's big mother. We're at the dawn of a new era, one defined not by technology and information, but by our relationships to each other and everything. We need to stop solving our human problems with technology and solve our technology problems with our humanity. Good evening. I was fortunate enough to go out this afternoon with my friend Daniel, who came uh, from Gothenburg, uh, and buy some nudie jeans. So I, I could stand here in something very Swedish. Uh, so did they look okay? Uh, <laughs> great store. I just had so much fun. And I went to Urban Deli. And they're very delicious, a little pricey. The shrimp are very small. Um, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure. Uh, to visit Sweden. Um, this is my third time here, my second time in Stockholm. And I can tell you, out of all the places I've, I've been fortunate enough to go, this is one of those places that you look forward to. And everyone likes to complain about, you know, the amount of, you know, weather and time and, you know, the daylight and cold. But, you know, you're very fortunate because when it gets dark and cold, you guys get to be together, you know. If you lived someplace where it was warm and beautiful all the time, you'd ignore each other. Oh, that's what you have cell phones for. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that concept today. If you're interested in making meaning of data and information, we can talk about that offline. I'll talk a little bit about that. But I really want to address this concept of, you know, does being connected to everything cost us our humanity? You spent the better part of a day learning about how much stuff is going to be connected. Isn't it amazing? Think about what it's like when it's all connected. We have that now. We call it the family. So maybe before we race into a world of being overly connected, we could look at how good we have it. So a little bit about me, because people love like really raw personal information. So. I was born October 11th, 1968. Uh, at that time, about 10,000 or so people were born at the exact same moment I was. Even smaller number of people than that had the parents who were born at the exact same moment that my parents were. My tax return was about $400,000 in change. You're like, why is he telling us this? Because it doesn't matter. All the information on me in the world doesn't change who I am. It changes your perception of me, but it doesn't change me. And more information about me won't change your opinion of me either. You've already decided who I am. But some, some one of the fun things are, based on population data and my health when I did this, I'm going to die on September 7th, 2050. But the good news is, if I were to move to Sweden today, I'd actually live an extra two years. Right? So just being here is better, right? Like, I, I feel healthier. I probably could, like, do the steps one more time. I was just spoke in Spain last week, and Spain, I, I'm about five months short. So I'll make sure I spend my summer in Spain and then come here. <laughs> because I want that extra five months. Um, and, and genetically, uh, this is interesting. Um, I was told I was Irish. Obviously, I look Irish to some folks. Uh, but if I, you know, look at my history from my profile, I'm only two generations Irish. Um, the rest of my family is from the Nordics. When I tell my father this, he had a meltdown. No, we're Irish. I'm like, oh my gosh, calm down. It's nothing offensive about being from the Nordics, you know. Give me a beer. I'm like, okay, there's the problem. <laughs> right? There's the problem. But there's an interesting genetic variant uh, for people from the, this part of the world where you, we are actually HIV resistant in a large part of our population. So I actually have the resistance to the HIV virus, and that comes from my Nordic heritage. Uh, it's something maybe some of you know, but it's a really interesting little fact. That's good information to know, right? Because you can then put yourself in clinical trials and studies to help make other people better. 
Uh, at 46, I've spent most of my career in IT. So like making sure that the systems you need to get into, you can't get into. And making sure that you change your password so many times you can't remember and you hate calling me. Uh, buying expensive things that won't work in six months so we can replace them and do it all over again. Like that was my entire career. And then two years ago at Cyborg Camp, yes, there's something called Cyborg Camp. Um, this year was at MIT. Uh, I went and I was there and some people saw me speaking and they're like, you're the guy with all the data. And I'm like, yeah, will you show us? So I showed a room full of people and Overnight, I've got my friend Daniel here in the audience, so he can tell you that my life changed because all of a sudden I went from the guy in IT to the guy who was in magazines and newspapers and television. I did a thing for Swedish television like earlier this year. Um, and that really changes your life because like, you just want to be a regular person. You don't want to be Princess Diana of data, right? Because <laughs> she ends up dead, right? You know, that's not the way you want your life to go. Uh, but it happens, and then you just kind of have to deal with it. Um, I've been called a lot of things. Uh, the one most people refer to me as is the world's most connected man uh, or the world's most connected human. I didn't decide that. A lot of people write Chris Dancy. You know. That was something the news decided. My favorite thing, though, I was called is I was recently in Manhattan and I was speaking at an event for Microsoft. We were working on a project for the city uh, around data. And this guy races up to me afterwards and he goes, I'm texting my daughter. She's in school in Minnesota and she knows who you are. And I said, really, show me. And he, he shows me his phone and she says, you know, you could, you're, that's actually Chris Dancy. He's like a robot from the future. So I'm thinking if college children in the middle of the United States know my 46 year old cyborg person, th th I must be doing something slightly right because college kids think I'm cool. Um, <laughs> But my, my story really goes back a step before this. And it's not something I ever talked about because I, it's just personal. And why should I tell the world like my, my personal news, like my personal story? It's like, that's too much information. But I was fortunate enough to ask to be speak at uh, TEDx Vienna last week. So I'm going to share with you guys something that nobody ever got to know until last week, and it'll be out next week in Vienna. Is that okay? Because there's more to the story. So there's a difference between Big Brother and Big Mother. Big Brother is what happens when you take lots of data and you control large amounts of people in a way that makes them act the way you want them to. That's Big Brother. It's scary. Big mother can be scary. She can be scary, but she's kind, and she just helps you along the way. She reminds you of what's important. Eat slow. Be nice to your brother. Don't fight. Wash your hands. That's big mother, right? Helps make you a better you. My big mother was Priscilla Dancy. She was born in 1943. And like a lot of young women in the 40s, she was probably full of hope, happy her parents weren't so stressed about World War II, excited for the 50s to show up and become a teenager. But like a lot of us, her story had a big change to it. So when my mom was 10, my grandfather, Gregory Brewster, shot and killed himself. And that was probably pretty traumatic for my mom. I don't know. I didn't know her when she was 10. And my mother never told me any of this until later in life. When my mother was 11, right before Christmas, her mother died of a massive brain tumor. So by the time she was 11 and a half, she was an orphan. And she was raised by people she didn't know. And as she became a teenager, she later on in life told me that she really struggled trying to figure out who she was. She could find no information, no pictures, nothing about her parents. She just had no identity. And she couldn't make meaning of what little information she had. But like we do as people, we're resilient. 
My mom made it through that part of her life, became a nurse, met my father, moved from upstate New York, Schenectady, in 1967, to Maryland, a small town called Westminster, uh, where she had me. Uh, and I'm sure this was the best day of her life, although I'd like to think so. But my mom made herself some promises that day that I didn't become aware of until much later on my own life. But things happen, you know? I was born, and then before I know it, it's 1982, and I'm, I'm a teenager myself. And my father, he had a hard time keeping a job because he liked to get mad and blow up and then get fired. Something I like to do too, right? So my mom ended up having to work like three jobs. And I remember from about fifth grade, so when I was about 10, until all through my adult life, I never saw my mom. She would like be gone before I got up in the morning. When I come home at night, she wouldn't be there. And I'd go to sleep and I might see her on the weekends and I might not. The problem was this created the same type of vacuum in my life that my mother experienced. Because my father was never working and he was mean. And my mother was always working, making sure we had a place to live and we weren't homeless. And this kind of made me confused. Well, who am I? Like, what am I? where are the pictures of me? Like, my friends couldn't come to my house and play because I was that family that didn't have parents at home. And you weren't allowed to play at that house. So I found out I was different, not from my friends, but from my friend's parents. Well, this had a big effect on me. By 2001, I basically was in my early 30s, and I wrote my mom this email. And, and I told her I was worried about dying of HIV. Little did I know I was resistant. Right? And the fact that I had all this gum disease, and my teeth were terrible, and I wasn't brushing my teeth. And, I was so fat. I was like 300 and some odd pounds. And I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And I was so mean to everyone I met. I just hated everything about my life. And she called me up right away. And she said, why? You know, what's going on? And I just started crying. And I said, I had to write that to you. I was drunk when I wrote it. And I, I'm sorry. I just, I, I shouldn't have mailed it. She goes, but you're special. Your life is special. It has meaning. I said, mom, I don't know that. I, just, I don't even have yearbooks. She goes, I can help you. So a year later, at Christmas, these boxes come, three big boxes. And then I was instructed not to open them, and they were hidden from me until Christmas morning. And then Christmas morning, I had to call my mother, and the first box was brought to me. And with my mother on my phone, you know how you had to put the phone like that? I opened up the first box, and, and she said, now lift out. Is it, does it say book one? Yes, mom, it says book one. Are you sure? Book one. I said, yes, mom, it says book one. So I lift out this big book one, and I set it on the floor. And while it's on the floor, I turn the page over. And on the very first page, there is all of this information. And as I start flipping through the book, she says, don't flip through it. I, I couldn't stop. There was report cards, there was hair, there was band-aids, there were scraps of clothing, there was notes about fevers and chills and sicknesses and girlfriends and boyfriends and all sorts of things I didn't know I had. See, my mom, even though she worked all the time, saved all my information. And she waited till I was the most lost and returned it to me. She made sense of a massive amount of data and restored order to my life. My mom died a year later. But my mom had an important quality. She had long-term thinking. She knew from her own experience that that information would be important to me in the future. She had no guarantee but she knew what it would have meant to her. So what do you do when your life is upside down, you're unhealthy, you've lost the only person who ever took care of you, and you need to fix yourself? Well, I decided to simply never go offline. I made a conscious decision shortly after that to start understanding my life through the systems I used. And a system can be something as simple as a credit card. How much money do I spend? 
The system can be a car. How many miles did I drive last year? How much gas did I buy with that credit card? And how much did I drive last year? Do I drive faster on Wednesdays than on Thursdays? But see, a lot of this information, like my mom's life and my life, was locked away from us. Because credit card companies don't want to give it to you. The car companies aren't going to tell you, right? Except for the gas gauge, every other gauge is, you know, done, right? Car is broken, car is not broken. Car is broken, car is not broken. Now we get, like, check engine. But then you freak out until it's off, right? So it's not much help either, right? So there has to be some better way to get this information if we can connect to all these amazing things we're talking about as an M2M -M device. Because ultimately, my M2M -M was mother to me. So the first place I looked for this information was my, the, my, my phone, right? By 2003, I was living on my BlackBerry. I mean, literally, if I could have crawled inside it, I would have, right? It was so exciting to have people need me. Oh, someone needs me. Look, it's lit up. I would sleep with it turned upside down so the light would show. And I'd like, keep watching. Is it, sh is it showing yet? Like, I was an early adopter to freaked out, right? Y'all are doing it now in bed. I've been doing it a long time ago. So I started saying, well, gosh, once I got a smartphone, there's even more information in here about me. So what I did was I started looking for this information in all of these systems. So the first place I looked was all the systems that I could connect to. So my dogs, I was always worried that Rocco would run away. I put sensors on my dogs four years ago and said, you know, gosh, you know, I want to know if Rocco gets away. Uh, my house put smart stuff in my house. My, the toys in my house, if I could connect them to the internet, they were. Uh, my car had a sensor in it that was measuring how I was driving. You know, uh, my mattress has sensors on it to measure how I'm sleeping. And what I noticed was, across all of these things, I started to see kind of a heartbeat to my life. Oh, look, if Rocco has a seizure, because Rocco has seizures, he's a dog, he has to take medicine. If Rocco has a seizure, the rest of the day is crap. Well, was it was a crap because he had a seizure and it kind of upset me, or... Was there something, was the temperature in the house funny? So there has to be a way to figure this out. So I started really simply in 2011 by taking pictures and, and pushing information into the picture. So in 2011 was the first Instagram photo I ever posted that in included the picture, the location data, the weather of where I was standing, and the song I was listening to when I took the picture. And I realized right then and there all my friends went crazy. They were so excited to see this picture. And it wasn't a very profound picture. It's winter, right? Probably looks all like Sweden in a few months, right? But it was full of information. And that really gave my, my friends a relationship to that moment, M to M, me to moment. And how did I expand that? So by 2012, I was doing much more than that. I was doing you know, from place to place, and my posture, and my heart rate. By 2013, I was doing my gait. I knew that this is a different height than that was a different height. Um, uh, by 2014, in Vienna, I was doing speed, constant location tracking and plotting, recording everything with cameras, environment, lights. It's a different temperature there than it is there. I mean, I was developing like six senses. I could tell that you know, you're not sitting as well as this person and you probably should have a nap. And, you know, there's just things you can start to see in people because you see information, right? It's really amazing how you develop this heightened sense of awareness once you understand the sensitivity of the world around you. But what really astounded me was this. <laughs> because inside here, there was a million things about me. All the applications you use on your laptop and in your phone define who you are. But if you were to go into all of them, you'd see that it's impossible. Behind those placards, all that data is me. But it took over a month to take all those screenshots. Who can make sense of that? I certainly couldn't. So I started on this, this path to start to understand who I was through the systems I used. It didn't have to be a sensor on my body or one in the room. It could be Facebook. So I divided my life up into a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the services I needed to absolutely live, like heat and a house, were the bottom. 
And the systems that kind of like were me and being fancy, like creating videos for YouTube, like I shouldn't be creating a video for YouTube if I don't have enough money to eat, but kids kind of do that today, right? So, you know, how does that work? And if I needed to go on a data budget, what, what can go, right? What's important? What keeps me functioning? And I realized that for most people out there, your life online is a lot like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Do you guys, remember, did you see Raiders of the Lost Ark? So at the end, you know, they take the, 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 the tomb, the, the ark, and, and they roll it and they hide it. And you could never find it. And you think, gosh, this thing is so magical. And they just threw it away. Just, you know, no one can find it. Second lesson I learned from collecting all this information was perspective. A lot like my mom, you know, whenever I use anything digital, it just, it just evaporated. We knew this back from when we played video games in the 80s and 90s, because if you pulled a cartridge out, it would say, everything not saved will be lost. You're like, oh, damn, OK, save it, right? How many of you still click on that floppy drive every time you create a document, every three seconds, right? You know what I'm talking about, because you know how hard it is to lose something you've worked on. And even though you don't need to do it, it's in the cloud. You don't trust the cloud, because you know clouds rain. So you, you keep, you save, you save, you save, you save. And this led me to this really disturbing awakening that everyone I know was systematically coming unglued <laughs> right in front of me. Everybody I've known for the last two years has literally become crazy. They're always busy. They're so stressed out. They're not sleeping. There's so much information. There's so much news. There's so much data. There's so much they want to do. There's always now, 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 now. Even the systems you use online are always about what are you doing now? See, the problem with now, while it's a panacea for monks and Buddhists, for the rest of us, it means never ending. Because when something is instant, it doesn't end. Instant isn't good. Instant means it'll never stop. That can be pain. That can be joy. That can be attention. Suddenly, that M to M is just really scary. So breaking through this relentless now of being connected to everything became a mission of mine. Because there's this concept that we've developed as a culture that nothing really happened until it's recorded. Because who records history? The victor. Right? You ask someone from Belgium about Sweden, they'll tell you a different version. You ask someone from Sweden about Belgium, you know what I'm saying? So you got to be really careful when it comes to recording information. Because as a, as a species, we've done a really good job at recording information. You can go back to some of the earliest cave drawings 30,000 years ago. They're still around. You can still go to caves in certain parts of the world and see ancient humans who didn't even have speech draw their life. And you go back 2,000 years, you've got papyrus. You've got stone tablets, the Rosetta Stone. You go back 500 years to the Enlightenment, once we had the printing press, and Europe just erupted with information. Right? We went from 10,000 books to 100,000 books in less, I mean, sorry, 10 million books to 100 million books in less than 100 years. We don't have too much information. I mean, we, don't, we have nothing to complain about. If you lived between 1500 and 1600, you were bonkers, right? There was a lot of information that was happening. And while not a lot of it exists, a lot of it still does. And this is the major difference between what's happening now and what's about to happen. Because what's about to happen is best demonstrated by what happened in Japan. In Japan, they have something called the Tsunami Stone. And it was put there 600 years ago. It's a really simple stone. It has a nice carving on it. It says, hey, there's probably going to be a tsunami. Don't build around here. You'll lose everything. 590 years comes along, no tsunami. This is a stupid stone. Build. What happens? Tsunami. Tsunami comes. The only thing left, the stone. So if you want to live in the future, crawl into a cave right now and start writing on a wall. You'll, you'll be in the future, I promise. 
Because being digital means like having this relationship with the future that you don't understand. So what does being digital mean? Well, if you're lucky enough to find a floppy drive, most floppies will only last 15 years. And that's if you can find a floppy drive. Most file formats from 10 years ago won't run on computers today. And web pages are changed or deleted every 100 days. Every 100 days, a web page is changed or deleted. And the data you're creating now in the cloud, who knows if you'll be able to find it in the future. And everything you do is digital. The music you buy is digital. And now it's streaming. You don't even own the file anymore. You just borrow a version of it for a moment. The books that we used to hold are all going digital. And yes, there's a lot of data you can collect in reading a digital book, but there's also, once the digital book is gone, it's gone. And we're about to cross that threshold where there are no more books. Libraries kind of defined cultures. Alexandria had a famous one. So you're obviously starting to realize that we are, as a species are opting in to more and more systems that are collecting information about us. But unfortunately, that information is becoming more and more temporary. It's ephemeral in nature. And the more ephemeral the system is, the more it's worth. WhatsApp, Facebook bought for $22 billion. How good are the messages from last week on WhatsApp? How good are they from yesterday? They're not. What's good about WhatsApp are the information that are happening now, 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 now. That's good for Facebook. It's not good for us, right? Waze, Google bought that company for a billion dollars. It's people in their cars who are texting and driving and probably getting in accidents reporting, there's a car cop here, right? That information on Google Maps is good for maybe an hour, and then it's... So if you can create a company that creates information that's good for about a half a second, you can be a billionaire. Stop working so hard. Create... Literally, create a company where the information is good for half a second and you'll make more money than you can ever dream of. Because we only appreciate what we can forget. We only appreciate what we can forget. Because if we can remember it, that's my spouse, she's always there. That's my dog, always there, always scratching at the door. But if you can forget it, ooh, that's, that's my dog, that's a good dog. That's my mom. Language is dissolving in front of us. Most people now communicate with pictures, right? If you've seen this online, people just reply with pictures. You know why? Because we internally have learned that the machines can't read our images. We will adapt, but the machines will start to adapt faster. Just in the new iOS, I was showing my friend Daniel, I'd say at lunch, there's a replacement keyboard that's not a keyboard. It just lets you draw answers. Basically, we're becoming kindergartners, right? Look at this, you know, and you send a picture. So how do you even search that? Let's pretend you could save it and print it out. How would you search it, right? So this is, this, this is, this is changing a lot of stuff. And then wearable technology and the information on the uh, Internet of Things. You know, I have a friend, I, I, I love her, but she went on Facebook and she went on this beautiful walk and she posted the photos, but she also posted a screenshot of how much she walked. See, it wasn't enough that she had a beautiful walk. She had to prove she took the steps. If you're so worried about proving you exist, you have a bigger problem than technology. You see, because technology is allowing you in real time to dissolve right in front of your own eyes. You, your family, your loved ones, disappearing anytime you touch something digital. So what do we do? Well, for me, I'm like, well, I, can, oh, I, I, I gotta fix this. I, uh, this, is, this is crazy, this is, uh, someone's gotta do something. So I went to my doctor and said, hey, there's all this information on me, right? All these things are connected in my house. We can use this information to make myself better. My doctor said, I don't know what you're talking about, but I have a chart here, and then I'm, I'm gonna take your chart, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that uh, you need to lose weight, and I know that, I'm huge. Uh, and you need to eat better, I know that, hey, I hate healthy food. And you need to stop smoking, I have to deal with you as a doctor. 
So he was no help. So I started keeping track of my own medical records. I then went and started using the internet and started like researching all the diseases I was developing and then going in and telling them all the cancers I had. And then I started, I went in and asked for all my medical records. I took 20 years and had them scanned and then sent them to Mechanical Turk and had them all typed and had all my lab results put in spreadsheets. Man, I've got pivot charts on blood work. And I started going to my doctor and going, it's February 2nd, every other February 2nd, when the weather's this way, I get a flu. I need antibiotics now. What are you talking about? Here's the report. I got fired. I'm probably one of the few people who's been fired from their doctor. Right? He said, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. You're out of your mind. I'm like, no, I'm using the information. You have this information, by the way. I don't think you're doing your job. You should have known this. Right? You ever think that? Like, shouldn't people, I mean, that's his only job. Have you ever been with a taxi driver who needs a GPS? Your only job is to drive. If your only job is to drive and you need a GPS, become a cake maker, right? But when you supplant your skill set with a piece of technology, you're pretty much guaranteeing you won't have a job, just a little secret for the future. After that, I started going to crowdsource community sites, sites where people would go, people like the worried well. These are people who aren't sick, but they're so worried about being sick that they constantly become hypervigilant about everything. Right? Everyone becomes a mother to themselves. Oh, is he sick? Is he sick? Is he sick? And I spent a lot of time on these sites and signed up to big data sites and found out like all the diseases that were in my area. Thank God Ebola didn't exist back when I was doing this. I, of course, like everyone else, put devices all over my body and started recording everything about I could, my heart rate, my blood pressure, uh, my temperature, my urine. I mean, if I could record it, I would save it and start to say, well, there must be some information here I can learn about myself. I realized very shortly thereafter that the United States was turning into the biggest medical economy on earth because our drug stores didn't look like drug stores, they looked like genius bars. It looks like an Apple store if you go to the drug store in America. There's no health and remedy, it's all tech. And if you look at the walls, the walls are full of devices and blood work. You know, basically, it's a one-stop shop like to just get rid of the medical profession, right? So what does that mean? Well, to me, I thought, okay, there's, there's, there's power in information, right? There, someone's figured this out. And then, of course, like a lot of people, I got involved in genetics and started trying to, to uh, study my genome through services like 23andMe, my microbiome. And by the way, the clicker doesn't work unless I'm very close, so I have to keep moving over there. It's not that I don't like you people. There's no data that's wrong over here. The, re the, the reception is better here. <laughs> and finally, I had to come to terms with a fetish, right? We all have things we have to deal with in life, and I, I, had to come out of, I, had, I had to come out of my closet. Which is, you know, I know this is a pretty liberal country, but I'm just gonna tell you, I had to deal with this you know, at this point in my life. Because, see, I had this problem. I would walk around, and I would see information everywhere. Right? I would get on an elevator, and I would see signs like this. You see, I have to tell you right now, I'm data sexual. Yep, and if you're data sexual, I want you to know it's okay. You can see me after the meeting. I can help you, all right? Don't be afraid to embrace your data sexualness. So once I had all this information, I decided I need to organize it. So how do I organize massive amounts of personal data? So the first way was to create a priority system for the data. So soft data was anything that I could fake. So if I could go to Facebook and say, hey, look at how amazing my trip to Sweden is, that's pretty fake, right? Because like, I'm jet lagged, I'm tired, and I can't get anything good to eat, right? Sorry, I, I'm American, we want like crazy, nasty, ugly food. You have nice food here. Second thing I had to do was say, well, that's data I can fake, like an email that says I'm not doing well, or a tweet, or, or a text message, or any of those things. Data that's hard to fake is hard data. So like my skin response is my skin response, my posture is my posture, the heat is the heat. It I can't fake those things, they are what they are. So hard data and soft data and how they relate to each other. And then core data, all the blood work, your analysis and genetic microbiomes and, and, and disease management information I was collecting about myself. Once I had that system worked out, then it was very easy to say, how then do I move these, this data priority system between constructed identity, hard identity, and core identity into a, a bigger system? 
So for me, that meant going through and creating a low friction data collection routine because I didn't want to write stuff down and I didn't want to have to look at a whole bunch of apps. So everything from using APIs to writing systems to scrape things to using services like IFTT and Zapier to some, some companies won't give you their data, but they allow you to share it on Facebook and Twitter. So I set up hundreds of fake Twitter accounts to automatically tweet things just so I could scrape Twitter and get the data. And I moved all that information into 10 areas of my life, health, entertainment, environment, social media, knowledge work, travel, opinion, content creation, money, spirituality. Once it got moved in, I used botany and binomial naming protocols to then say spirituality prayer, spirituality meditation. So I studied how we named plants to figure out how to name and classify information about my life. I'm in tech. So <laughs> you're like, yeah, that's pretty creepy, yeah, I know. Um, I then used Maslow's hierarchy of needs to decide, you know, kind of what was important at the data layer and not the priority layer. Then I wrote an elaborate system to move information through the internet to a repository where I could then see my life, search my life, and then run analytics on my life. The one that most people focus on is this. So this is my Google Calendar. It has tens of thousands of entries every day. So right now, that was 411 pieces of information I just collected. Everything. Because there's profound amount of value when you can then say, well, show me money and faith. Show me entertainment and environment. When it's warmer, do I listen to certain types of music? If that's true, do I eat different? I then moved it into uh, files on the web where I could store it and search it and have more, much more detail. I moved it into spreadsheets, and then I used uh, an open um, uh, deep learning engine at Stanford uh, to analyze large blocks of text. So a day for me is pretty crazy. Now, Google Calendar only lets you see 15-minute slices, but if you could actually expand and look in journal view, a day of my life is crazy profound because everything is there. So if I need to know what went wrong, I can tell you. For example, I'm the last person you want to take to HR. Because <laughs> you're wrong, <laughs> and I'm documented. <laughs> and you're not going to win. Because documentation beats everything. But the most amazing thing about having this volume of information about your life is you see how amazing your life is. You might think you had the worst day in the world. Your wife or spouse just left you. You're losing your house. You just got fired, and your dog bit the neighbor. But there are about 800 other things that were amazing that day that you're missing. So if you could see your life like I could see my life, you'd realize how precious your life is. And you could actually make changes in your life that would change everything. And I learned some really important things. The first thing I learned was the value of information. So it cost about $10,000 to gear up. It costs about $20,000 to put crap all over your house. But the amazing thing about that is if you actually were to just buy the equipment, it's only about $8,000. So what did you spend $32,000 on? Who wants to take a guess? What did I spend $32,000? The, the equipment was only $8,000. What's the, what's the $32,000 extra? Connection speed, yeah? Accounts. Accounts. Every one of these companies will sell you a bobble for $99, but they'll charge you another $99 to get the information. I don't know. It doesn't sound like such a good deal after all, does it? Let's see. You want me to buy a fitness band and then spend money to buy me back? That's not the way this works. Yeah, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. Your body and your home are the app store, and your life is about to be sold back to you. M to M, money to machine. <laughs> I have to remember this M to M thing. I like that. So the devices are cheap. This is the takeaway. The devices are cheap, but buying your life back will cost you more than you could ever, ever, ever imagine. And then identity. Because the identity that you create by using machinery is profoundly different than the identity you think you live. If you've ever been in a grocery store 
and you're checking groceries and there's no one around, you're just scanning your groceries, everything's fine, right? Scan, put it in a bag. But as soon as you, know, you notice that kind of person who watches all 10 registers, you, you, know, you don't want to make a mistake because if that, if that man needs to come over and, and scan the card and give you that look like you can't pick up a piece of fruit, right? No one likes that feeling. And then if someone comes up behind you, you literally start to like, make sure you scan perfectly. How many of you try to do the perfect scan, right? right? So you're, you're changing your behavior for the machine. I want to make sure we're all clear about that. The next thing is, if you've ever had someone say, let's take a picture together, and you all get together and become like Cirque du Soleil, right? Or someone says, oh, let me take a panorama, and you start dancing with your phone like you're on the Titanic doing a waltz. Or you can't get a signal, so you become Lion King. It's, it's real simple. If you're contorting your body for a machine, the robot takeover you fear happened already. Right? We shouldn't be creating technology we have to shape ourselves for. It's backward. And we shouldn't be buying our own information. That's backward. All right? So the computers really were the first kind of step in this thing. But it gets, it gets much more deeper. It gets much more ingrained because we become the tools we use. This is a tweet that someone shared that I think is so profound. The card reader at the gas pump won't read my card. So now I have to go inside and pay like a poor person. <laughs> so this person's identity is literally tied to having to speak to a human. See, it's not automation, it's human avoidance systems. I don't know, we say automation because it's clever and it sounds really spunky. Let's automate that. That means let's take people out of it. I love this one. This guy's on Tinder, it's a dating site. He doesn't have a picture, he has his bank balance. <laughs> or this one, my seven-year-old paused in the middle of thinking of a sentence uh, and my 10-year-old said, hold on, Dad, he's buffering. <laughs> you see, you become what you bend into. You become the hammer. It's not that everything becomes a nail. Everyone becomes a hammer. You become the system you use. So maybe you should be careful about that system. Finally, perspective. See, I used to think I had a hard time sleeping, right? That's me like waking up in the middle of the night. And I would obsess, why can't I sleep? There's something wrong with me. But once I had more sensors in my house, I found out that I was waking up because there was noise in the room, the temperature changed, there was light at dawn. You see, I wasn't broken, the world was. And with enough information, you see you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. The world is absolutely screwed up, though. And you can kind of come to terms and go, OK, it's not me. It's life. And kind of deal with that. But that's a, hard, that's a hard thing for some people to get to. You see, for me, resilience, the act of getting up and trying again, is the act of perpetual perspective. When you can perpetually, in the moment, just like the system, not think about what you're not doing, but think about what you've done and who you are and what's important. You become resilient. That's the power of the information that we're missing. It's a resiliency that gets us through things. We don't need pills. We need skills. And this information can provide those for us. For me, the most biggest piece of feedback around this type of living was what I did with it. So I said, okay, I've got three years worth of information. This was two years ago. I eat about 3,800 calories a day, or some days I eat about 3,500 calories a day. If I took 1,000 da days worth of data, and I lifted that data set up, and I said, okay, here are the days where there's 200 calories difference, which is about a muffin at the espresso place here, right? Actually, about half a muffin. Um, and I said, who are the people, places, things, environments, behaviors, systems, tools, interactions, what are the things in common with these 1,000 days where I missed the 200 calories? 
It was about 31 of them. So I said, OK, if there's only 31 things that are, make one day 200 calories different, why don't I just make my house and my life act like those 31 days? Send an alert to my, my Google Glass. Send a message to my phone. Change the lights. Lower the temperature. Do anything to make my mind think in the periphery I was in one of those days. Change time and space. By doing that, I lost 120 pounds. You see, your information is worth so much more than you think. And how you get it back and how you make sense of it is important. Because for me, using my phone and using all of these systems required me to have something my mother taught me, long-term thinking. You see, I'm not around for 80 years. I'm around for 500. I'm a tsunami stone. And my life is a message, and I'm not going to miss it. If you're going to become machines and act like machines, at least be res resilient as machines. What are the implications for all of this? Some kind of futuristic prognications? I think a lot of people today are focusing on social mobile analytical cloud, when you should be focusing on sensor environment, algorithm, and mesh. Right? Your internet should not go offline, no matter what you design. We've gone from a phone <laughs> That, that takes pictures to a camera that makes calls. It's now a credit card uh, device, and it's now about to become a piece of medical machinery. This is anything but a phone. It's now a credit card and a doctor. And some companies are taking this financial information, and they're linking it. So this is like a big competitor to Apple Pay. It's called Currency. These are the big vendors. You guys have 7-Elevens all over town here. When you use your phone to pay with Currency, not only do they give them the financial information and the location, they give them your medical information. 7-Eleven shouldn't know how you slept when you buy coffee. Shouldn't know. Nope. They shouldn't know. I don't care if they know like, how much the coffee is or what 7-Eleven, but you shouldn't know how I'm feeling. That's, that's my business. All right, so there's some privacy implications there. Also, Google and Apple are terraforming our bodies. Right? Now that these health devices are in Android and iPhone, your body is becoming a platform. And they both have IoT initiatives, HomeKit and Nest Connect. They're turning your body and your home into the internet. When that happens, Everything changes because the amount of information they understand about our behavior becomes different. And do you think they're going to help us get better? Does capitalism really support making people healthier? I don't think so. Not so far. So what are they doing with it? Well, one of the biggest examples was about four months ago, there was an earthquake in Silicon Valley and Jawbone. I'm a big fan of Jawbone, by the way. Uh, they don't like it when I mention this. But they released a graph, and it showed everybody waking up during the earthquake. Not one person complained about, you know, are you watching me sleep? Oh, look at that. We all woke up during the earthquake, and no one died. Ha, ha, ha. Right? See, I was explaining to someone earlier, there's this there's a event horizon between your convenience and your privacy. If it's convenient enough, you'll, you'll just give it away all day long. Remember when they put the thumbprint in the iPhone and everyone went crazy? Oh my gosh, I gotta have my thumbprint. And like two weeks later, you couldn't buy a pizza and you beat someone up, right? Like your convenience trumps your privacy. And then finally, this concept. Are we gonna create systems that are big brother or are we gonna create systems that are big mother? Jawbone went on to release a connect to your, to your home via Nest. So now when you're sleeping, your house will change temperature automatically to make you sleep better. It took me five years to make that work. They did it with an app update. Right? All this information that uh, Apple Health's collecting. And now my car sensor, the automatic, is talking to my home and adjusting the temperature and the light settings in my home as I drive home. Did you see what happened here? This isn't the interface anymore. You are. You're literally the trackpad for life. You know, someone should just draw a big finger on you, right? You're the keyboard. Your behavior is what changes life. I used to call this in presentations, Daniel will tell you from years ago, I used to call this existence as a platform. I used to go to the IT community three years ago, guys, you don't understand, computers don't exist in 10 years. We are the computers. And life just changes for us. And they chased me out of the community. That's a whole other story. 
right? You guys know I'm, you guys know I'm telling you the truth. You probably didn't think you were a trackpad, and some of you are pretty attractive trackpads, but you're still trackpads. So what do we do with all this? Well, uh, I'm going to leave you with just three thoughts. One, when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone, I encourage you all to go back and watch the video. He didn't come out and talk, I've got an iPhone. He, he said, I'm announcing three things today. I'm announcing a revolutionary new way to browse the internet. And that was the touch capacitive stuff. Uh, a, a, I screen, an iPod that you can touch the screen and select music. And a new way to communicate with your friends. Right? And it turned into the iPhone. It wasn't three products, it was one. Well, when Tim Cook announced the Apple Watch, he said, I'm announcing three things. The world's most accurate timepiece. Why does Apple want the most accurate time? Why one one millionth of a second does it make a difference? Because everything is happening now, and now needs to be measured more accurately. The second thing, I'm announcing the world's most accurate fitness tracker. Well, that sounds good to me. How much are you going to charge me to sell me my, heart, my, 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 my body information back? How many apps, how much money am I going to have to pay to understand that I'm eating a Kentucky Fried Chicken too much? But the thing that probably concerns me the most was the third thing, an intimate new way to communicate. He said, because with Apple Watch, if you and I are friends, I don't need to even talk to you. I can just avoid you, and I could send you a little picture, XOXO, swipe, and you would get it on your... Look at that. Oh. Oh. Or I could do this. I could be in the other room and I could go, they call it taptic instead of haptic, taptic. And then you'd feel it on your wrist. Oh, he just tapped me. Tap him back. <laughs> Gosh, we're in love. <laughs> or I could actually take my heartbeat and send you my heartbeat. Can you imagine two years from now, you're in bed with your spouse and your spouse says to you, you haven't sent me your heartbeat. Like we're cuddling. Feel it. I'm pressed up against you. I know, but I waited all day. You know, Literally, just put your phone in bed with your spouse's phone and go out for dinner. You don't have to wash the sheets. And everything's taken care of. So watch out, because I think Apple Watch is a bigger deal than people are giving it credit for. It's like saying the iPhone didn't change anything. Oh, well, we mapped the genome in about 10 years. We mapped the internet in about three years. We mapped our social graph in about four years. We're about to map the body, and we're about to map everything about behavior. Once that happens, within five years, we no longer will buy applications. We will buy habits and environments. Because when everything in your house is connected to the internet, and you are also connected to the internet, you don't buy applications. You buy habits and environments. You see, because we've become the internet. We want people to answer us like Google, to talk to us like Twitter, to friend us like Facebook, to date us like Tinder, to picture us like Instagram. We are the internet. We don't go to the internet, we are the internet. Without us, there is no internet. We create the information, we change it, we delete it. It's the personification of things. It's not the internet of things, sorry. We want to put ourselves in things and see them. And that means putting the internet in it to see us ourselves. Because if your phone's turned off, you can actually see your reflection. But if you turn your phone on, you disappear. Why? You see, we need to stop solving our human problems with more of this and start solving our technology problems with more of this. Thank you. No, 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 stay, 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 stay. <laughs> so first, a gift from oh, Telia Sonora. Thank you, <laughs> you Telia Sonora, for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a million questions to you, and the ones I wrote to you, like, uh, uh, like, a little bit, you, you wake the researcher in me. Like, I read so much about dualism and not separate mind and body and, and you know, why are physical data more true than thoughts and so on. 
but I don't think anyone would be interested in that. Mm. That is another <laughs> discussion between you and me. Another it might be. I, <laughs> I think it's interesting. Yeah. Another question is like, do you store your data? Uh, yeah, I, um, I, 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 I store it to uh, local hard drives. I store it in the cloud. Uh, but more importantly, and something most people don't know until TED, and I just talked about this, uh, for about a year and a half, I've been printing every day's worth of data. Uh, so I now have warehouses or storage full of b boxes of paper because of what I talked about. I mean, the cloud it, rains. Well, it, the cloud does rain. So, yeah. and, and paper copies mean something. So it's really interesting. If you could print out all the photos on your phone, right, it would fill the stage, right? You've got, you know, you ever see these, these stories on the news? And it's like, never before, before seen pictures of Stockholm being built. And you're like, oh, you can wait and go look at all the never before seen pictures. Your phone is full of never before seen pictures. They're of you. <laughs> They're of your kids. You've never seen yourself, right? So I just think maybe it's important we start printing some of this stuff out and like maybe using it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another thing is like, what about recommendations, knowledge sharing? You told me yesterday, just sit still and listen to your data. <laughs> you know, what if people like you could sort of, in the meantime, before I sort of have the time to sit still and just listen to my data, what about your knowledge? How can you sort of share it? Well, I'm doing the best I can, but I'm only one person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully, I'll be four but or five like people. But like restaurant recommendations. Well, yeah, you know, we were talking about restaurants. You know, I think you know, right now, restaurants have recommendations. But as I've talked to a lot of journalists while I've visited, you know, one of the things that makes you eat fast is really bright lighting. And every phone has a light sensor on it, right? So literally, you can download a sensor for your phone and see how bright it is in this room. Anything above 200 LUX, and you're going to eat faster. It's just impossible not to. Like, you're just uncomfortable eating. McDonald's literally are toxic, not because of the food, but because of the light. And then if you, the sound in a restaurant will kill you. Like, today at lunch, it was over 60 decibels. I mean, none of you ate healthy at all. Forget the food, was, you know, whether you liked it or not. So restaurant recommendations, I think, will be based a lot more in the next year on the actual environmental conditions in which people are eating. And then now that everyone's phone has this health information on it, we'll be like, this is how sick the restaurant made me. So it's going to be really hard for businesses. You know, one of the things I told my company when I, when I started there a few months ago, because I'm at a healthcare company now, was I just did some readings around my desk. It was toxic. I mean, the CO2 levels, the light, the white noise, the, the sitting chair, it was basically a death trap with a computer. <laughs> right? So why are you going to, you should pay me a lot more if you're going to kill me, right? <laughs> So, you know, I think it's one of those things as, as, as workers, you know, there's this big data everyone likes to talk about, but little data, right? What's, what makes you and I healthier? You told me you love to run, and we talked about... No, I'm not love to run. Okay, I've sorry. told them once a week. Oh, once a week, but you <laughs> Twice. Oh, it, it's working, whatever it is. So, um, you, know, it's, you know, that's important, but, like, what could you learn from your run data if you just had simple things like, you know, it, does three degrees affect your run? You have no idea, right? Would wearing one extra piece of clothing make you want to run more? Could you run three times a week with just knowing a little bit more about how you run and why you run? Probably, but the time to take and understand that data is just monumental, and where would you even start? So I always tell people, start with something simple. Like if you run, record your run, but also make sure you record the weather. Every single app saves weather information now. You just need to do an API call to an open weather system. A lot of apps, I use this one called Day One, it records where I am, <laughs> What I'm doing, am I walking, am I sitting, am I running, am I driving? It records the weather where I am. It records like six things the minute you launch it, right? That's a great app. But we build apps for the phone that are stupid. Remember when we built up PCs and we built these gigantic forms you had to fill out? Why did we put a form on the PC? And why when you go to a web page with a form do you absolutely become paralyzed? Because you know if it disappears, you have to start over. And that's five minutes you can't be reading Twitter. Right? So, I mean, we have to stop building technology that's less smart than the device. Right? This is really smart, but the only sensor that uses this is a game with balls. Mm -hmm. Right? But why couldn't you, like, look for more information? Why couldn't tilting? There's no, there's no patent that says that if I'm using an application on my iPhone and it knows I'm inside, because your phone knows you're inside, knows I'm higher, the minute I walk outside, it should say, ooh, it's going to be cold, and the closest car is about two minutes away. It knows you're outside. Or if you're depressed, it could say, 
hey, you've been inside for three days. I bet your, your dog would like a walk. Right? So there's really kind ways we can use the technology and use these sensors, but we refuse to do it because we created a system of computers that was built on, well, we can't store that much. It's by 1982, we're run out of space, and if we make it to the year 2000, everything's going to stop functioning, so don't worry about it. And then we build these things, which are like spaceships, and we go, let's put a monkey in it, because that's all, that's all we need to do. Let's put a monkey in it. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and let's put a filter on the monkey. No, but I agree with you. Yeah. I actually also think that we treat uh, mobiles wasting. a little bit like stationary computers still. Yeah. We don't use them. For the exponential yeah. potential. Yeah. But another thing I thought about was uh, with enough data, it's perhaps easier to make the meaning making. Yeah. Uh, but then I know of a company, it's called We Me Move. They put an accelerometer on the chest and they track the rhythm of your skiing mm. and how you move your left and your right side of the body. And then they tell you if you want to go Vasa Loppet, which is a famous skiing race in Sweden, uh, as far as. Vasa Loppet, yes. Okay. As fast as uh, one of our famous skiers, okay. you need to do this. Oh. And that's what I mean. Like, I need so to. So they had took a very specialized use case, took their business model, and then gave you a goal. Yeah, like you need yeah. to work more yeah. on your left hand side. So I mean, that's or... kind of like a habit, like I talked about. You know, that's taking very specialized stuff. I mean, your banks know what you're spending, but they have no vested interest in helping you understand it. Exactly. Your grocery store <laughs> knows what you're eating but they have no vested interest in helping you understand it. Hmm. There's a club card at the grocery store. You know that card that gets you discounts? Do you know why that exists? Because if you tried to get the credit card company to tell the grocery store who you are, they'll charge you for it. So grocery stores, you'll notice club cards are all over now. It's because we can't buy data from the credit card companies because they got us. All right? So yeah, again, to your skiing yeah. case, all these businesses have specialized use cases, but I hate to say it and sound like a terrible like non-capitalist you know, capitalist person, yeah. but the, the need to make money supersedes the need to be kind and human. People sit on data like a leprechaun, me lucky data, you know, me lucky data. You know, it's like, get rid of it. You, you can't do it, give it to the customer. Customers will play with it, they'll mm. do something with it. Mm. No, I agree. Mm. We need to stop. Okay, we can I know. Talk We're about you all Thank day. you so Thank much, you. Thank you, guys. I love you. <laughs> Thank you.